<laughs> that woke everybody up. Not so close. Can you hear me all right in the back? In the front? All right. Well, I'm John Erlson. I'm the director of the Museum of Natural and Cultural History. And tonight we're very fortunate to have Scott Williams visiting from Washington State. This is the third lecture in the archaeology lecture. Um, archaeology of Oregon and archaeology month and all that. We do this every year in the fall and then... Every spring, usually in February, we have talks on uh, paleontology. And so look for, is it February? Yes. Yeah, we'll be having additional uh, series of lectures about, oriented primarily around paleontology. Uh, when I first moved to Oregon in 1990 and started working at the U of O, uh, within two or three years, I got very interested in the Oregon coast and worked for five, six, seven years doing survey work, looking for archaeological sites, dating lots of sites, and also excavating a, a small number of sites, working closely with the Oregon Coastal Tribes to help uh, document and preserve those sites. And I was fortunate enough to work all the way from the northern, you know, the California border down in the Brookings area, all the way up close to Astoria. And one of the, my favorite areas was the northern Oregon coast. It's just absolutely beautiful, but the archaeology is as spectacular as the landscape is. And one of the reasons that I got really intrigued about the northern Oregon coast was uh, a variety of ceramics that had been found in coastal sites around Nehalem Bay and Neetarts Bay that looked, they were Asian ceramics, they looked like they were relatively early, there had been a few studies of these, and I at the time was very interested also in the potential effects of early European contacts with Oregon Coast or Pacific Coast tribes, and whether or not they may have transmitted diseases very early, long before actual settlement. And so one of the places we looked at was in the Halem Bay, where these ceramics had been found, and the beeswax, which Scott will talk about. I had a student come in one day and say they'd found a rigging block on the beach on the northern nor Oregon coast, and it was a Spanish-style rigging block, and we quickly went up and looked at it, got a radiocarbon sample, a tiny sliver of wood from the outermost ring and dated it to about the time of several earlier radiocarbon dates on beeswax and such. And it, you know, it appears very likely, as Scott will talk about I think tonight, that there was a manila galleon that wrecked on the Oregon coast many years ago. And so this is a very rare instance of uh, early cultural contact between European peoples and the Oregon Coast tribes. There's a lot that we still don't know about it. Scott's been working on it for seven years now. And let me just tell you a little bit about Scott. He is currently the Cultural Resources Program Manager for Washington Department of, Department of Transportation. I got to know him in the 1990s when he was teaching at Lane Community College. He has a bachelor degree from the University of Hawaii. He's done a lot of work in Hawaii and Pacific Islands, and a master's from W State Washington State University, also known as WSU. And uh, I think what would be best at this point is if I sat down and shut up and turned this over to Scott, who knows a lot more about Nehalem and these topics than I do, or that even that I did 15 years ago. Thanks, Scott. Thank you all for coming. I'm going to um, try to talk Kind of quickly, I got a lot of material I'd like to cover. Um, one of the things that is really fascinating about the Oregon coast to me is there are all these kinds of mysteries, these shipwreck legends, um, tales of, of caves full of Spanish silver. I'm going to talk about some of those tonight, but it's a lot of stuff for a fairly small state, so I'm going to get right into it. Um, so I mentioned there are a lot of, of these stories in Oregon. These are a couple of book covers. I just went on the internet, did Google Books, typed in um, Pirates in Oregon and Treasure in Oregon, and these are some of the titles that come up. And what's kind of interesting is, so I live in Washington now. I've been there about 11 years. You don't find books on you know, Pirates of the Washington Coast or Treasure Tales of the Washington Coast 
or of pirates of the northern California coast. It's really right here in Oregon. And so one of the things we've been doing, we've been mostly focusing uh, for the last seven years on one particular shipwreck. It's called the Beeswax Wreck, and I'll explain why. Um, but as part of that research, we've been looking at some of these other uh, stories and legends. And um, there's a lot of them. For, for Oregon being the size that it is, there's a lot of them. They tend to be concentrated on the North Coast. Some of them read kind of fantastically, and yet I think there's, there's a grain of truth behind a lot of those. So we'll get right into that. So what I'm going to touch on, these uh, mysteries of the Oregon coast, and let's see if my graphics work here. Um, there's a bunch of them. So Konapi, he was uh, said to be a sailor, shipwrecked sailor, sometime prior to about 1780, maybe, maybe as early as 1720. Wrecked at Clatsop Beach, was a blacksmith. The Clatsop Indians, the chief took him as a slave, but he was a blacksmith, so he was valuable. Um, he had a bag of Chinese coins with him. So when the first Europeans and the first Americans arrived in Oregon and Washington, the local Indians called those coins Konapi's money, and they traded them up and down the coast. And you can find them in museums. There are, um, they were sewn onto garments. They were family heirlooms. So who was Konapi and what year was he here? We're not really certain. Um, one of the stories says his ship was copper plated. Copper plating didn't occur until after 1780. So maybe he's that late. Other folks think he was earlier. Um, there's a great book on Oregon shipwrecks written in the mid-1970s. And it mentions, mentions in there a diver. And it's kind of one of these stories, you know, my cousin knows somebody who knows somebody who knows somebody. But it's a story of a, of a sport diver off Clatsop Beach uh, in the late 60s, real early 70s finding Spanish gold bars and coins. And of course, he didn't tell anyone, and he took them, and he um, never turned them over to a museum or anything, so we don't know how true that story is. Um, a lot of you have probably heard about Neocani Mountain. There's strange, strangely carved rocks on there. Some people think it's Francis Drake. Some people think it's um, uh, maybe the survivors of one of the Spanish galleons. Um, I got a phone call from a guy who was convinced it was marking the Ark of the Covenant. And when I asked him why would the Ark of the Covenant be on Neocani Mountain, his answer was, because that's the last place anyone would think to look. <laughs> but there is something that's going on on Neocani Mountain. Um, there's Nehalem, the beeswax wreck, which is mostly what I'm going to talk about tonight. Um, there supposedly is a wreck at Three Rocks uh, on the Salmon River estuary, and that's one where somebody saw it kind of in the mud, in the 19th century, and supposedly there's a chain that runs out into the estuary, and um, the local landowner was flattening his land. There was an Indian shell midden, a prehistoric habitation site, and supposedly uncovered the skeleton of uh, an eight-foot-tall African male. Now, how he knew he was African or eight feet tall was never made clear. Um, and, and that's another recurring theme on the Oregon coast. Out at Neocani, the treasure that's supposed to be buried there, Supposedly, the crew that buried it, the, the pirate crew, um, rode ashore and killed an African slave and put him on the treasure uh, to keep the Indians away. So one of the things we do see is this mixing of sort of stories and, and legends and trying to sort those out, which is a little bit of what I'll do tonight. Just three weeks ago, I got a phone call from a guy who had heard about our project, told me his brother-in-law knew of a wreck just south of Florence, an old wreck. Um, that had Spanish or, or English coins on it. So I don't know where, um, but he was going to try to find out. The question mark is I got another, I get a lot of phone calls from people. Um, somebody knew somebody who knew somebody who had seen a cave on the Oregon coast. You could only enter at low tide um, and from the ocean, but it was full of silver bars and Spanish armor. That's another kind of recurring theme in a lot of these stories is there, you know, the caves or the treasures are always buried someplace that you can only get at at really low tide or they're, you know, um, on top of an inaccessible mountain. And at some point you have to ask yourself, if you're a pirate, first of all, you're not going to bury your treasure because you're going to go spend it. Second, would you really go to that much effort to bury it um, unless you never intended to come back? So silver cave out there someplace. Um, Here's where we get a little more information. In 1811, uh, a Hudson's Bay fur trader 
um, and in Astoria, sailed up or canoed up the Columbia River. And as he was going up the river towards Bonneville, his Indian guides told him, hey, by the way, there's an old white guy who lives up here. He's the son of a shipwrecked sailor. You want to meet him? So the fur trader said, yeah, I'd love to meet him. So he wrote in his journal in 1811 that he met this old, nearly blind Indian. He called him an Indian. His Indian guides called him a white man. And the Indian, the old, nearly blind Indian told him that he was the son of a shipwrecked Spanish sailor. His name was Soto. Um, and his father had wrecked at the mouth of the river many years ago, had him, and then went south trying to find kind of his people. Soto's real interesting because, to me because he's definitely there. There's a good historical record of him. He left descendants who's, um, who could still trace their family back to him. But where did he come from? And who, who was his father who wrecked on the Oregon coast? Was he a survivor of our beeswax wreck or some other Spanish shipwreck? And we don't really know. Um, Lewis and Clark and the Astorian fur traders also mention uh, Jack Ramsey up in Astoria. Jack Ramsey was a Clatsop Indian. He was red-haired, fair-skinned, freckled, and he had the name Jack Ramsey tattooed on his arm. And apparently Jack Ramsey was his father, which doesn't sound like a Spanish sailor, but an English sailor. Um, but he was well known in Astoria, and a lot of folks writing about him in the early 19th century speculated he was either the son of, a, of a, this English sailor or maybe um, one generation back um, because of the genetics of red hair that maybe his grandfather was a survivor of the beeswax wreck and his father then was this English sailor. So a lot of stuff going on on the Oregon coast. Um, and like I said, some of it is fairly well documented, some of it's not, but we keep looking and trying to tie all those things in, in together. Okay, so who am I and what am I doing? Um, the Beeswax Rec Project is, um, we're a nonprofit group, it's all volunteer. Um, I am sort of the de facto public face of the group, but it's actually a group of archeologists, historians, um, geologists and coastal geomorphologists, uh, students, community members, the Nehalem Valley Historical Society. It's a group of people who are all interested in what was the beeswax wreck, where did it come from, why was it carrying all that beeswax, where was it going, and really most importantly, when did it wreck? And as John mentioned, were there survivors? Did they have some kind of contact with the local Indians? We started in 2006. Um, I'll say this again, we're not a profit, we're a nonprofit group. This is not a treasure hunt. The wonderful thing about Oregon is it has really strong archaeological protection laws, and those laws extend to historic shipwrecks. So let's say tonight my phone rings and it's one of my divers, and they call me up and they say, We found it. You know, here it is, we got it, we just found a gold chest full of gold bars. We don't get to keep any of that. Anything that, that comes off this wreck, if we find it, comes right here to the University of Oregon, to the museum. Okay, so that's the way Oregon's laws are set up. Um, so a lot of people, when I tell them that, go, then, well, why are you looking for it? Why are you spending all this time and money if you don't get to keep the stuff? Because um, that's really the treasure, that history, that knowing what's going on, to be able to kind of solve that mystery. Um, drives my wife crazy, because I spend my vacation time doing archaeology. I do archaeology full time for the State Department of Transportation, and then I spend my vacations doing more archaeology. Um, but that's who we are. Um, the membership, we always take volunteers. We're always interested in people um, who have an interest. We have brought in students. We have one woman who got her uh, master's degree out of Central Washington University analyzing our ceramics for us. So when we set up the project, so I, I got brought into the project. I was, I'm not, I guess I am now, a, a shipwreck archaeologist. I wasn't when I started. I got brought into the project through some other guys, um, old friends. A lot of archaeology is kind of who you know and who you've worked with. I got a phone call one day from an old friend of mine and said, how would you like to help us work on a galleon, a Spanish galleon? And I'm thinking Caribbean, Florida, um, <laughs> maybe Saipan. And I said, you bet, sign me up, where is it? He said, Oregon. And I went, you know, I paused for a moment and said, there's no Spanish galleons in Oregon. He said, yeah, there's one, we think. 
So, but when we started, we weren't sure it was a Spanish galleon. Um, as John mentioned, in fact, John himself had done some research on um, the galleon or, or the shipwreck long before we did. There have been some other archaeologists who've been investigating it since uh, really the 1980s. So there were all these different ideas. Was it Spanish? Was it a Chinese junk? Was it maybe a Portuguese merchant? Was it Sir Francis Drake? So one of the things we wanted to do when we started the project, so when I got brought in, um, what I told the rest of the group was, okay, before we can even start, we need to pull together all the information and come up with a research plan, what we call a research design that says, here's all the information we know, pulling it from all these different sources, what does this tell us and how are we gonna go about looking in the field, rather than just let's show up and start looking kind of thing. We wanted deter to determine what was the beeswax wreck. We'd love to locate it, and I can tell you right up front, we have not located the wreck yet. Um, we're still working on that. And then we want to confirm our idea of, well, is it a Spanish galleon, and if so, which one? So we've been doing the archaeological and the historical research. We do a lot of public outreach, so thank you to the museum for having me down here. Um, and eventually, what we would love to do is if we could find it, if we could get the money to do excavations, is there would then be a public exhibit probably here at the University of Oregon, maybe at the Columbia River Maritime Museum on this wreck. So why is it a beeswax wreck? Um, the very first fur traders who settled in Astoria in 1811 were surprised when the Indians came to trade with them and they brought big chunks of beeswax, and this is one of them. Um, you can see there's numbers carved in it. And they were surprised because there are no native honeybees in Oregon. Um, they were introduced by the Europeans in the 1850s. So they asked the Indians, where are you getting this beeswax? And the Indians told them, oh, a big ship, a big boat wrecked many years ago down at the mouth of the Nehalem River. This stuff's been washing up ever since. So um, they went down, they looked, and they said, yeah, there's wreckage all over this beach. Wonder where that came from, it's an old wreck. Um, and the, the very first guy to write about it in 1813 mentioned he thought it was a Spanish galleon, given the beeswax. Lewis and Clark mentioned the beeswax as well. They don't mention the wreck, but they mention the beeswax. So it has been found, these big blocks. Um, this one is at the Tillamook County Pioneer Museum. It's about yay big. Um, there are historic records of blocks up to 200 pounds being found. There was so much, or there was so much beeswax down there at the Nehalem um, Beach, so where Nehalem State Park is today, that the early settlers actually mined it. They supplemented their farming income by mining beeswax and selling it in Astoria and Portland and San Francisco and Honolulu. There was so much of it that people started to think this can't be from a shipwreck, despite the fact that it had the numbers, it has letters carved into it, there were candles, some of them still with wicks. There's bees, parts of bees in it. But there was so much of it by the, by the late 19th century when the Spanish trade had died off, people thought no prehistoric ship could be carrying this much beeswax. It must be natural. It's mineral wax. And it actually started a little mini oil boom in the Halem. Um, investors from the Midwest came in, um, started drilling. The locals were happy to lease them land for um, drilling for oil, even though they knew it was from a shipwreck. Um, so for several years, there were people out there drilling for oil. Never found it. The wreck was very well known during the 19th and early 20th centuries. You can go to newspapers from that time period and there's articles about it. We have found uh, newspaper articles from New York, Chicago, San Francisco that mention this wreck. And what would happen is the wreck was scattered on the beach and in the water and every few years the sands would change, the tides would get really low, the wreck would appear and there'd be a flurry of interest and then it would get reburied and kind of would die down again. Uh, the last time it was seen that we know of was in 1926. And we think there's a whole bunch of reasons why it hasn't reappeared since then that I'll get into here. So our first question was, what was the wreck? And this is what we looked at. We pulled together, um, there's a bunch of artifacts. There's all that beeswax. Uh, there are Chinese ceramics. John mentioned those. They've been washing up. They've been found in Indian habitation sites, Indian village sites. Um, there are some other wreck items, the uh, pulley block, and I'll show you a picture of that, that John radiocarbon dated. Then there's the historical records. There's the Indian histories. There's the settlers who talked about it, all the people who first settled the Oregon coast, and the Spanish records. So I'll just run through these kind of quick. 
here's the beeswax, some different blocks of it. Um, the, like I said, you can find it in a lot of the coastal museums. Uh, people have it in their private collections. In the early, late 19th, early 20th century, the thing you did if you lived in Portland was you went in the summer to go to Nehalem, camp for a week, and look for beeswax. That was kind of your summer thing. Um, the beeswax has all these symbols carved on it that at the time were described as strange Kabbalistic symbols. And that really confused people. And I'll tell you what those are in a minute. Um, there's a bunch of other artifacts that have come up. This is that pulley block that John mentioned. A beachcomber found that in 1992. He was collecting driftwood for a bonfire, pulled that out of the sand, and luckily for us, before he chucked it into the bonfire, he looked at it and thought, well, that's weird. And he took it to um, the Columbia River Maritime Museum. They looked at it and said, oh my gosh, that's a 17th century Spanish, classic Spanish design right there. This is another pulley block that was actually pulled off the wreck in 1896 by a local resident. That's um, up in Corvallis. Um, this little oil jar, it's a silver oil jar from a Catholic priest's uh, sacrament set. And my picture's really misleading. It's about this big. Um, that's a 17th century um, Dutch silver oil jar. Um, that was pulled off the wreck in 1896, the same time that, not the exact same trip, but the same year that was pulled off. These are bronze handles from a chest that a local um, a resident in Manzanita was digging a ditch out, and it's all sand. So he's digging and digging, all of a sudden he hears something metallic. And he knows, he's heard about these stories of the shipwreck, so he's thinking, I've hit the jackpot, treasure chest. Digs up these chest handles, he actually found three of them dug a giant hole, hoping, you know, chest handles, the gold's there someplace. Never found the gold. Um, those are at the Tillamook Museum. And then just about um, four years ago, a beachcomber found this. It's a teak wheel. Um, I don't know if you folks can see it from where you sit. There's a small groove in there. We think it might be the part of the pulley that goes in here. So the, the part the rope would wrap around and spin around. Um, we're not exactly sure. This, this edge doesn't look like a pulley edge, but the rest of it does, and it's the right size. So beeswax, pieces of the wreck. There's some other wood pieces of the wreck I didn't put pictures of, and a lot of this Chinese blue and white porcelain. And for an archaeologist, this stuff is pretty exciting because porcelain was a, um, was a consumer good. It was a luxury good. The Chinese made it. The Europeans wanted it. Um, if I were to buy like my set of porcelain um, to show off in my house, and then five years later, John gets a better, you know, the newer pattern, it's like, oh my gosh, I gotta chuck my old pattern and I gotta buy a newer one. It's like a, an iPhone, you know? Every, every two or three years you need a new iPhone because they're different. Same thing with porcelain, and because of that, we can date it. We can date the styles and the changes fairly closely. So you can see these are some of the porcelains that have been washing up over the years, um, and the, the Nehalem and the Clatsop Indians were taking this wreck material and they were making it into arrowheads and stone tools. They didn't need rice bowls um, or teacups, but they needed arrowheads. And that porcelain is actually pretty widespread. It occurs from Neetarts, uh, south of Tillamook, up into Washington, the um, Willapaw Harbor area, over to uh, the Portland, Vancouver area as well. So there's the Indian oral histories. Um, the wreck was first noted in 1813. The Indians told the fur traders, this has come from a shipwreck, wrecked many years ago. There's four or five different stories of survivors. Those are another thing that as you go through time, they start to get muddled in terms of, um, are they all one wreck? Are they multiple wrecks? Were there no survivors? Were there up to 30 survivors? So trying to tease out that information. But, um, most of the accounts say that some guys survived the wreck. The one says up to 30, lived with the uh, Nehalem Indians for six months uh, before they got too unfriendly and the, the Indians drove them away. Um, so were Konopi and Soto somehow related to this wreck? Konopi seems to be a totally different wreck, um, a totally different sailor, probably much later. Um, Again, if he was really in a copper-bottom boat, he would have wrecked in the 1790s. Um, 
maybe earlier. Soto, maybe. It's one of those, unfortunately, nobody knew how old he was, so how old is a really old person in 1811? Are they 50? Are they 80? Are they, you know, 99? We just don't know. If you juggle the math around, Soto could be the son of a beeswax wreck survivor if you have a lot of, if the survivor was pretty young when he wrecked, if he had children when he was much older, if Soto was 80 years old or more. If he's not a survivor of the beeswax wreck, or the son of a survivor of the beeswax wreck, that raises a whole other question. What the heck wreck did he come from? Because he's, he's too old to be Konope's son. So now are we talking three prehistoric shipwrecks? And why all on the Oregon coast? And I don't know the answer to that, but we're working on it. So I mentioned there's historic wrecks. Um, you go through old newspapers. The Oregon Native Sun was a scientific journal from the 18, uh, late 1890s to early 1900s. Lots of articles about the wreck um, and people seeing it. Now the nice thing for us is, and I'll tell you in a minute why we think it's a Spanish wreck. The Spanish kept really good records of their ships. So really quick, a little bit of Spanish history. The Spanish conquered North and South America, the New World, um, based in Mexico. They started a colony in the Philippines. They wanted the colony in the Philippines to get those Chinese goods. China was the center of luxury goods. Spices, silk, porcelain, um, those kinds of things. The Spanish couldn't sail from Spain to China because the Portuguese controlled that half of the earth. In 1594, I want to say, the Pope divided the world into two halves. He gave the Portuguese one half and the Spanish the other. Nobody else mattered, just the Portuguese and the Spanish. So to get Chinese goods, the Spanish had to sail from Spain to Panama, cross the Isthmus, sail from Panama or Mexico to the Philippines. They did that route, the, the Mexico to Manila, back to Mexico for about 250 years, every year. A galleon left, or two galleons left Manila in June or July, sailed to Acapulco, got in usually in December, January, or February, hung out till March or so, April, sold all the Chinese goods, took all the silver that the Spanish were mining, well, the, the Incans were mining for the Spanish in Peru, and all the gold from Mexico, and they shipped it back to China. The Chinese loved silver. They didn't care that much about gold. Silver was the important metal. So it's estimated in that 250 year period, at least one third, maybe one half, of all the silver mined in the New World by the Spanish went to China. It was a huge drain on the economy for the Spanish. It was a big trade deficit because the Spanish were buying luxury goods. And all the money was going out into China and luxury goods were coming in. Sound familiar? Um, see, the more you learn about history, the more you realize it doesn't change. So there are Spanish archives in Manila, in Mexico, and in Spain. The really good ones are in Spain. I, I take that back. There are good ones in Manila and Mexico. They're a little harder to, to get to and to work through. The Spanish kept incredibly good records basically for taxes and insurance. They, the government wanted its share of all that commerce going through. So they kept crew lists. They kept cargo manifests. Um, and they're pretty detailed. This one, this is just an example of one of those. I put it up because it mentions one of the galleons we're interested. The Galleon uh, Santo de Burgos, uh, leaving Cavite, which is the port in the Philippines, in 1692. So that's the kind of information you can get out of these. We do know from the research we've done, um, the one galleon we're interested in, there is a thousand page document in um, Spain on that ship that details what cargo it was carrying, who the crew was, um, what they did. Um, it, the ship left in 1692, had to turn back, then left again in 1693. So one of the goals of our project is to get that thousand page document and to get it translated because it's in old Spanish handwriting. Okay, so we put all that information together. We've, we've been in the field now for about six years. This is what we know. There is definitely a shipwreck at Nehalem. There's no question about it. That shipwreck carried tons and tons of Philippine beeswax with Spanish shipping symbols. Those strange cabalistic symbols I told you about, they're Spanish shipping marks. They're in the archives, they're in all those Spanish journals, um, they're inscribed on pottery, they're found in Spanish sites. So there's no doubt about them. Uh, I forgot to mention one of the things carved into a lot of the wax blocks were the initials IHS, 
Um, and my Latin is really bad, but it's in hoc, in hoc something. In his name, uh, it was wax destined for the Catholic Church. Um, the ship also carried a large cargo of Chinese porcelain that was destined for Mexico, not Japan, not China, not Korea, um, for Mexico. And I'll tell you how we know that in a minute. It had a, a Catholic priest, or at least a Catholic priest's possessions, but probably a Catholic priest. And based on the ceramic dates and the radiocarbon dates, the ship wrecked sometime after 1670 and before 1710. And we can narrow that date down to between 1680 and 1700. Now for archeologists, especially prehistoric archeologists, if we can nail something down to a 20 year period, that's fantastic. The only way to get tighter than that would be to find the wreck and find either a cannon with a date stamped on it or a coin with a date stamped on it. So beeswax wreck was a Spanish galleon on what they call the Manila trade. That's the Manila trade. They would start here in the Philippines, as I mentioned. They'd sail out. They'd sail way, way north towards Japan, across the Pacific. As soon as they got near the west coast, they didn't land on the west coast. As soon as they got near it, they turned south and they went to Acapulco. Um, assuming they made it, they'd refit the ship. They'd take that silver. They'd sail back. They'd buy more Chinese goods. The Chinese brought stuff to Manila. And then they'd do the whole thing again. So, Early in the trade, starting in about 1565, there was a couple of ships a year. By about 1600, 1605, the Spanish government had it mandated to one ship a year would sail and then one ship a year back. Very tightly controlled by the Spanish government. So when I mentioned if we find the wreck and we find artifacts, they'll come here to the University of Oregon. I should add, they'll come here if the Spanish government lets them because technically they belong to the Spanish government. This was a Spanish government ship Governments don't relinquish claims on their ships. It's not a commercial, even though it was carrying commercial cargo, it's not a commercial ship. So if we find it, the Spanish government gets first claim to it. I mentioned, what's that? Yeah, <laughs> there you go. Either way, I don't get it. It either goes here or to, the, or to Spain. Um, I mentioned they would not land in California. There weren't a lot of settlements in California until um, a little bit later after the trade. The main reason they wouldn't land was these, these this trade was the bread and butter of the Philippine colony. It was the only reason, only reason Spanish went to the Philippines, was to get rich. It was kind of the um, dot-com boom of its day. You could go to the Philippines and you could make anywhere from 300 to 500% profit. So during its heyday, Manila was one of the richest cities on earth, um, richer than London and parts of Europe at the time. Um, because of that, the, the merchants... Even though they were government ships, the merchants who were in charge of them, the ship captain was not in charge of the ship. A council of merchants was. They wanted to get that cargo to Acapulco and sell it. They would not allow any deviation, no exploration, um, no turning back unless you were really desperate, no landing in California to explore. It was get straight to Acapulco. Okay? And that went on until even after the Spanish, the Spanish king mandated they had to stop in Monterey and San Diego. They ignored it. Um, the Spanish traders in the Philippines ignored everything the Spanish king said, pretty much. Um, the, at, at one point, I forget the year, the Spanish, uh, the merchants in Spain were concerned about the competition. So they petitioned the king. The king said, okay, you cannot sail a ship any bigger than 400 tons. The merchants said, fine, and they redefined the ton. So these ships, <laughs> these galleons, were huge. They were the super tankers or the supercargo carriers of their day. They averaged um, 800 to 1,000 to 1,200 tons. Some of them were 1,400, 1,600 tons. One of them was 2,000 tons. So 180 feet long, um, 40 or 50 feet wide, and usually about six stories tall. They drew 25 feet of water, and then they had all these superstructure. In fact, sometimes they put so much superstructure, um, one of them sank in the Manila Harbor because it was so top heavy. It just kind of rolled over. And there are accounts in those Spanish documents of the port inspector in Manila telling them, tear off two or three decks before you can sail. Okay? So um, why that wreck is now up here is one of the big mysteries. There is no reason the wreck, the crew would have, would have willingly sailed to Oregon. They weren't exploring. 
Um, there was nothing up here for them. All they knew about the West Coast from about Central California up was it was foggy, it was rocky, there were no harbors, and to them, the Indians weren't very friendly. So that's one of our big mysteries is why is the wreck here? And we have some ideas on that. So this is an example of what they were doing. This is Chinese blue on white porcelain. Um, remember Europe coming out of the Middle Ages, starting in that age of enlightenment. Um, they didn't know how to make porcelain. So they had to import it from China. And it was compared to the stoneware, the heavy pottery the Europeans were using, this stuff was just fantastic. It was beautiful, it was lightweight, it was durable. High trade in that. That wasn't the main cargo. It's the main cargo we find today because it's durable. The main cargo was silk. Silk and um, spices, none of which we find today. Okay, so I've told you it's a, it's a Spanish galleon. We know it came from Manila. We know the years we think roughly it sank. How do we know this? Well, only the Spanish traded in beeswax. So one of the ideas when we started was it's a Portuguese merchant. The Portuguese didn't trade in beeswax. They especially did not trade in beeswax with Spanish cargo markings on them. Okay? Neither did the Chinese. Um, that silver oil jar is from a Catholic priest, so very unlikely to be on a Chinese junk. Um, Chinese junks don't drift to the New World. So one of the things we've been told is, well, you don't know for sure it's not a Chinese junk. It would actually be more exciting if it was a Chinese junk. There are three galleon wrecks on the West Coast, one in Oregon, one near San Francisco, and one in Baja. There were no Chinese junk wrecks. So if it was a Chinese junk, that'd be even more exciting. But there's a lot of reasons there are no Chinese junk wrecks in the West Coast. There's a lot of Japanese junk wrecks. And there are cultural reasons why the Japanese drifted here, but not the Chinese. And you can ask me about that later. Um, the last thing people thrown out to, to us was, well, maybe it was pirates who captured a Spanish galleon and then wrecked. It's possible. But picture this. You're a pirate. Francis Drake was in a 40-ton ship. Um, I forget how big Thomas Cavendish's ship was. It might have been 80 tons. But pirates didn't have big ships. So you're in, let's say you're in a big pirate ship. You're in a 100-ton ship, and you've just captured a 1,200-ton Spanish galleon. It is loaded with wealthy Spanish people with their own personal fortune, porcelain, silk, spices, probably some gold, probably some silver, and beeswax. What's the last thing you're going to load on your pirate ship? <laughs> probably not 50 or 60 tons of beeswax. So I don't think it's a pirate ship. Okay, so we've established, we're convinced it's a galleon. Um, now we need to know which galleon. So I told you that they, they did this trade route for 250 years. In that 250 year period, a lot of galleons sank. They ran into storms, they ran into reefs, they occasionally ran into pirates. But only four in that 250 year period set sail from Manila towards Acapulco and were never seen again. And by that I mean the Spanish looked for them, and they would spend 10 or 20 years looking for them because the cargo was so valuable. So most of them they found, they wrecked right there in the Philippines, they wrecked in the Marianas Islands. Um, one or two of them made it all the way to Acapulco to be captured by pirates hanging out outside of Acapulco. One made it all the way to Acapulco and sailed right on by, but they were, they were waiting for it, so they saw it and they were you know, like, yay, the galleon's here. Oh, it's sailing right by. They chased it down, the whole crew was dead. They'd all died of starvation or thirst probably two or three weeks before, and the ship was just sailing on its own. So four ships are missing. We know the dates of those ships, one in 1578, one in 1586. Then there's almost, well, there's more than a 100-year gap, 1693 and 1705. So we have two early on and two later ones. Only the two later ones fit that time period by the ceramics. Okay, so that, not just based on uh, the radiocarbon dates, if you really stretch them, go back maybe that early. But really for the ceramics, they only fall within that period. Okay? So those two ships are the Santo Cristo de Burgos, which left uh, Manila in 1693. She had actually left Manila in 1692, ran into a bad series of storms, lost all her masts, and after, I want to say six months, limped back to Manila. Um, the, the pilot, the guy in charge of navigating, um, there are actually four pilots. All four pilots were basically um, put in prison because it was a crime not to make it to Acapulco, um, even though you have no masts and no sails. Um, 
it sat in the Philippines. They refitted the mast. They kind of re, um, reprovisioned it, loaded some more cargo on, left again in 1693 and was never seen again. Um, the other one is the San Francisco Javier, which left in 1705. The San Francisco Javier is a galleon that has often been said to be, that's the beeswax wreck. And that's the one that we thought was most likely to be the beeswax wreck based on the historic accounts of it. Um, we now think it's the Santo Cristo de Burgos, and I'll tell you why. Um, a really great thing for archaeologists happened between 1693 and 1705. In 1700, um, January 21st, 1700 AD to be precise, a mega earthquake struck the Pacific Northwest. So remember the big earthquake in Japan a couple years ago, the magnitude 9, 9 plus? That's how big the earthquake was here. Um, and it created a tsunami just like the one in Japan, probably a 25-foot high wave, smacked into the Oregon coast. So as we started, we realized that, that that tsunami was going to tell us a lot about the wreck. Because if it was the 1705 wreck, and it's wrecking onto a beach that has been eroded and partially washed away by the tsunami, it's going to come in closer, run aground, and then maybe get buried. And the wreck is, is buried under the beach. If it's the 1693 wreck, it's going to wreck on the beach or in shallow water, and then the tsunami is going to go over the top of it. And what happens to a wreck when a tsunami goes over the top of it? We weren't totally sure. Um, so we started doing our work. The historic accounts are really clear. Um, they talk about a shipwreck at the mouth of the Nehalem River and another shipwreck back here where the airstrip is now, over, um, kind of over the high dune. The earlier accounts say this is the beeswax wreck. So 1850s to 1870s. You start to get into the 1880s, 1890s, they stop talking about this one, and they talk about this one. And this was called the beeswax wreck. So our idea was she wrecked here, grounded, the waves started pounding into her, the current pushed her or her pieces north, and then the storm waves washed her over that eroded beach in 1705. Um, so we went out, we got a magnetometer, I mentioned we we're all volunteers. We have no money. We borrowed this $30,000 magnetometer from the company. Um, this man, Dr. Sheldon Briner, um, actually perfected this form of magnetometer, retired, loves to help guys like us, came up, ran the magnetometer for us. We walked the entire, well, I shouldn't say we, Sheldon walked the entire beach from the jetty up to Manzanita, five miles, down, back, down, and back with that magnetometer. And the idea for that was we thought if it was buried somewhere on the beach, we would find cannons or anchors, and they would kick off the magnetometer. Nothing. Cleanest beach, one of the cleanest beaches Sheldon says he's ever worked on. No <laughs> shopping carts, no nothing. Um, so then we thought we need to know a little bit more about the tsunami history. How much did the beach erode? How much has it grown over the years? All the local residents tell us, oh yeah, the beach has gotten like 100 yards wider just in the last 50 years. So um, Kurt Peterson, he's a coastal geomorphologist from Portland State University. I called him up um, and said, Dr. Peterson, I'm working on this Spanish galleon wreck on the Oregon coast. Would you be willing to help us? And I kind of got this silence. And then a, a what? You know? And then like, well, and I could tell Kurt thought we were crazy. Um, but he came out because it tied into his interest. Kurt is a um, paleo tsunami specialist. His, his field of study is those old tsunamis on the Oregon coast. So he brought out his ground penetrating radar unit. We profiled the dune. We cored the dune looking for tsunami deposits. Tsunamis leave very distinctive deposits in sand dunes. And I'll show you that in a minute. Um, we borrowed another boat. This was the local doctor's Zodiac. We took that borrowed $30,000 magnetometer and we duct taped it to the front <laughs> of this borrowed I don't know how much that Zodiac cost, but it was brand new. The doctor had never even used it yet. So he loaned us his Zodiac, his truck, and his trailer. We borrowed it, went out, ran up and down the beach to get a little further out, thinking, well, maybe the wreck's further out in the water. Um, got some data. The next year we went back, we borrowed this big boat and got some more data. Still nothing real promising. Um, this is Kurt's map. Here's our ground penetrating radar line and then different places we tested and we did some more lines. And one of the reasons we wanted to do this was we thought, okay, how does a wreck get in here? The dune is too high for it to wash over. Well, maybe the Nehalem River, which now comes out and runs behind 
the spit, used to come straight out. So maybe the ship got into a channel and then washed in. So we profiled the whole dune. There are no old channels. The spit has been pretty much intact, except for the tsunamis, um, for about the last 1,000 years. Okay. While we're out there doing that, okay. so if you've ever been to Nehalem State Park, it's a big dune, big wind, sand deposited dune. I saw all these rocks. And they kind of struck me. I know enough about geology to know you don't find water-worn big rocks in a wind-blown dune. So I'm thinking, well, maybe they're from the river. So when Kurt Peterson, the, the coastal guy, came out, I said, Kurt, why are there all these rocks in this dune? And they're, you can see they're different sizes, and they're poorly sorted. You can, they go back. And Kurt said, oh, it's an old road. He was out there 10 years ago. The locals told him it was an old road used to build the jetty. Okay. One thing I know is old roads because I'm a transportation archaeologist. You don't build old roads out of poorly sorted, water-rounded rocks, <laughs> because they go. So then Kurt said, well, I don't know. Maybe it's ship's ballast. Well, same thing. We started looking around, um, and it could be, except we're well away from the river, and it's over a big area. So Kurt, at that point, goes, oh my gosh. And I said, well, it must be a flood deposit, but it's poorly sorted. He said, no, we're too high for a flood. He said, I think it's a tsunami deposit. So he came back out the next year. He brought his um, coastal geomorphology class. We had 20 students from Portland State University. We um, gave them maps of the spit. We gridded off the whole spit into 100 meter squares. And we told them, go to each intersection and record every rock you find. And we dug some test pits and things like that. And what we found was there is this deposit of cobbles. And what, it, what Kurt calls it is a tsunami cobble drape deposit. So picture this. Here's your sandy spit. A big tsunami comes in. It washes over the spit and up the Nehalem River. All that water's got to come back out. It comes back out. It brings with it all the river sediment and dumps it back on the spit. And so because we measured the size and everything, we could see that the bigger ones are up here, closest to the river, the main part of the river. And then they get smaller and smaller as you go south. You don't see them over here because they're buried under the dune over here. So Kurt was very excited. He says it's the first time anyone has ever shown one of these cobble drape deposits on the Oregon coast. That got us thinking, OK, how's that going to affect a wreck? And that also told us, because it gave us the height of the spit when the tsunami hit, could the ship have washed over the spit after the tsunami? And the answer is no. There is no, no I should say, no recorded storm in history has been big enough to ever push wood over this dune into this area where the shipwreck was. So then we started thinking, well, how do you get shipwreck over there? Well, if this river water's going in, maybe the shipwreck's going with it. So we looked. I told you I'd show you a picture. This is what a tsunami deposit looks like. See the dark sand, the rocks? All that's from the Nehalem River. It's not a flood deposit. It's this turbid tsunami deposit. Um, and we were able to date that through a, a, a technique to date, actually, the sand just below it. Um, and it dates to right about 1700 AD. So we're really excited by that. There's also an older tsunami layer. This is the tsunami of 900 AD down there. Um, so we mapped that over the spit. Here you can see it's buried by wind-blown sand. Other places it pops up because the dunes move across. OK, so tsunamis are really weird things. If you remember all those videos from Japan or maybe the ones from Indonesia, that much water moving so quickly and with so much force, it does strange things. A lot of us think, oh, a tsunami comes in, it wipes an area clean, and then you know, scours it clean. They don't work that way. Um, they do things like, you can see this F-16 fighter jet still sitting on its wheels, washed into this building. This house was um, seen floating about five miles off the coast of Japan, still in one piece. This man was found floating seven miles out to sea on part of the roof of his house. Survive the wave going in and going out. I think this picture shows it a bit better. So this is one of the villages. All this debris, the wave went in, way past there, came back out, boat sitting on top of a house, boat, boat. So that got us thinking, OK, what happens if a ship wrecks off the Oregon coast in 1693? Remember, these are big, strong ships. They're not going to just um, um, wreck and then break into little bits. They, they break into chunks. And they can actually withstand some pretty severe pounding. We know that from the, the uh, historic archives. 
not years of pounding in the ocean, but a year, maybe a little bit more, depending on the waves. So if a ship hits and a tsunami hits it, what would happen to that stuff? So we went back to all the historical um, information. We went back to the archaeology reports. And we started to realize one of the mysteries of the beeswax is the fact that people report finding it miles inland. And they report finding it under the roots of 200-year-old spruce trees. And um, high up in places where the high tide couldn't reach. In fact, it was, it was enough of a mystery that the US Geological Survey sent a geologist out in 18... 93 or 1899 to do a study. And he's the one who said, oh yeah, this is definitely shipwreck. And it's weird because it's way higher than the ocean is now. Um, ships timbers found. So the red stars are reported wreck locations. Uh, ships timbers found, wax found, um, these little half moons where the porcelain has been found. And what's really interesting, I'm going to show you a picture of porcelain from here, is the porcelain's really different. The porcelain that's found up here is coming out of Indian village sites. It's little, it's broken, it's made into arrowheads, it's the little dregs they threw away. Um, there's porcelain washing up further on the coast, it's water-worn. It looks like it's washing in from offshore. The porcelain here is big and fresh and it's mixed in that tsunami deposit. It's actually in the tsunami deposit. Um, so to us that was kind of the smoking gun. How do you get porcelain into a tsunami deposit five years after the tsunami? You probably don't. The, the, the porcelain and the wreckage were scattered on the beach. The wave hit it and scattered it inland, we think. That's our current model. This is one of those sherds. Um, we've worked real closely with Nehalem State Park and the park rangers down there. We work real closely with the community. One of the things we tell people is, if you're hiking along the beach and you find anything you think is a shipwreck artifact, porcelain, metal, wood, um, beeswax, don't pick it up and take it to the park office. Remember where it is and bring a park ranger out. And then they map it and record it and they collect it. So that's how we know this porcelain is occurring. You can see there's part of that cobble deposit in that cobble deposit. Whereas if somebody just brought this in and said, well, I found it on the beach, we wouldn't know it was in the tsunami deposit. OK, so I better wrap this up. So where are we now? Um, we are really confident we've identified the ship. If I had to bet money right now, with John, I would bet it's the Santo Cristo de Burgos of 1693. Um, it wrecked on the Oregon coast a year, well, six or seven years before the tsunami, probably scattered on the beach a bit, and then the tsunami really scattered it. Um, we've done all the geological work. We've managed to get offshore a couple of times to look for potential wreck sites. Um, but what we really need to do now, if it's the galleon we think it is, and it drew 25 feet of water, the lower hull is probably actually still out in the water. No one has ever found cannons or anchors. And these ships carried six or seven anchors and 20 or 30 cannons. So they must be out there someplace. So we think they're still offshore, probably buried in the sand. You need the right kind of gear to get offshore, which is a pretty expensive proposition. We've done a little bit of work with more borrowed equipment. Um, this was just this summer with a side scan sonar. Um, but essentially what we need to do is search from about the, the Nehalem River mouth actually used to be right here. So we need to search from here up to Arch Cape with an uh, underwater metal detector and a sonar, um, which gets expensive, but we're working on it. So if anyone is friends with Bill Gates, <laughs> have him call me. That's it. Thank you very much. I will very happily answer questions um, until they kick us out of here. So. I got one in the back. Yeah, so the question was if we know what year it was and we think it blew off course, could we look at the, um, the weather data from that year? Um, we could, and I haven't actually done that yet. Um, but that is something we could look at. We're kind of assuming, because it is so far north, that it probably got disabled in a storm, because it was already kind of weakened. They had replaced the masts um, and probably just drifted. You know, a lot of the st winter storms come out of the southwest, so they, they push it up into the current, and then it would start drifting down. 
So that's, that's the most likely thing. And probably one thing I should mention just real quick is there are, in the Spanish records, there are accounts of these ships surviving um, 10 or 12 typhoons in a row. I mean, just getting hammered, they would close all the hatches, screw everything down tight, and ride them out. They were that strong. Yeah? Where you showed it where you need the sonar, what's the depth of that water there, average depth? The average depth of the water where we did the sonar, it goes from right on the shore, you know, so like a foot, um, out to about 100 feet. For a bunch of reasons, including the way things are washing ashore, we think if the wreck is out there, it's within 60 feet of water or less. Um, we think. It depends on how it would have broken up. I've been told by local fishermen that back in the 1970s, they used to be able to do um, dredge netting for shrimp. And then in an area of about 150 feet, they would occasionally dredge up Chinese porcelain. And at the time, they thought, yeah, that's cool, and chucked it back over the side. Um, now, how that porcelain got out to 150 feet, whether it drifted, floated, or the wreck broke up, the other thing with these wrecks or these galleons being so big is there are accounts of them you know, hitting a rock, punching a hole in the side, losing ballast and cargo, and then floating back up again, sailing for another 1,000 yards, hitting another rock, punching another hole, floating back up again. And this could go on for half a mile or a mile, dumping cargo as they went. So yeah. Um, I mean, the records from, for the sailors, sailor ships, are there records yeah, so the question is, you know, are there records of people actually picking up shipwreck sailors? The Spanish have a lot of records, not on the northwest coast, though. Um, it's not until you get into the 1850s or so that you start getting records of shipwrecked sailors, either, you know, American or, or British or Spanish, Japanese junks wrecking on the coast. Prior to that, there are these stories of people wrecking earlier, but there's nothing real definite. Yeah. Is there enough value in the ones that were totally lost that somebody's looking with subs or robots on the routes that they can find them? So, so the question is, is there enough value? Um, you know, people are looking for galleons all the time. Um, typically, a galleon like this coming from the Philippines its treasure was silk and spices. That stuff's all going to be gone now. So the value really is more, it's the archaeological value. Um, you know, yes, there probably was gold on it, because the Spanish passengers <laughs> probably had gold on it. But it wouldn't have been like those galleons in Florida or the Caribbean where there's, you know, 100 tons of gold or anything like that. So really, it's, it's the archaeological value. And as I mentioned at the beginning, this wreck in particular is actually protected by Oregon state law. Actually, all shipwrecks in the US are protected by federal or state law. So yeah. Well, that relates directly to my question. And that is, how does Oregon shipwreck law differ from that of California or Washington state? Good question. So the question is, how does Oregon shipwreck law differ from uh, California or Washington. I don't know California's, but I do know Washington's. If this wreck were um, on the north side of the Columbia River, and if we found it and we excavated it, we'd get to keep 90% of the value of the wreck. The state of Washington gets 10%. The, the salvager gets 90%. However, you still have to get an archaeological excavation permit. And the state of Washington wouldn't, if I, if I found a wreck in Washington and said, hey, it's full of gold, I'm going to go get a giant suction dredge and suction it all up and go pocket the money, they wouldn't give me the permit. There has to be archaeology to go with it. So that's why a lot of modern day shipwreck hunters are out in deep water, because they don't fall into those laws. So, yeah. Do you have time to touch on the cultural reasons you mentioned why uh, Japanese mm -hmm. ships yeah, I'll, I can do that real briefly. So the question was, why are there Japanese junks on the West Coast, but not Chinese? So um, in the early to mid 17th century, the Japanese shogun basically decided he didn't want Japan being contaminated by foreign ideas. He closed off the country. And he made it illegal for Japanese to sail um, to other countries. And so because of that, they, they changed the boat design in such a way that you couldn't go really far in them. They were essentially designed to fail in the open ocean. Now, of course, the Japanese still sailed around the island of Japan in these cargo ships. But if they got caught in a typhoon on the east side of Japan, typically the very first thing that would happen is their rudder would break and their masts would break. Or they'd cut them off so they didn't swamp. 
So uh, Japanese crews sailing the east side of Japan, they'd get caught in these typhoons, blown out to sea, they'd catch the Japanese current. And they'd watch, so much like the tsunami debris is washing ashore now, the junks would do that. The Chinese were sailing between China and the inland Japanese sea to the west coast of Japan. They didn't get onto that other side. And the Chinese had really good junks. They were very seaworthy. So they were much less likely to lose a mast and lose a rudder. So every junk you ever read about that washed up in Washington or Oregon or Alaska or California or Canada is a Japanese junk. That's, that's the cultural reason. Would we be able to look at Russian trade records from that time to maybe give us an idea of what the Spanish were doing up here? Right. So the Russian trade records, they have great records of the Spanish being up here later, but they're actually too late. They're in the 1760s, uh, 1770s, 1780s, so about 100 years after our wreck. Um, so I'll just finish with, you know, the really cool thing about this wreck is if there were survivors, um, they definitely had interactions with the Indians. They might have brought diseases with them. Um, but they had all that cargo with them too. And the Indians adapted that cargo to their own culture. I mentioned they didn't need rice bowls or teacups, but they needed arrowheads and stone scrapers, and they broke up the porcelain. They traded the beeswax all up and down the coast. They used it for um, medicine. Um, they actually used it as for candles um, and to waterproof things. And, and in archaeological sites around the region, you do find metal artifacts. So they were taking things like ship spikes, knives, that sort of thing as well. So there was definitely an effect. Okay. Thank you.